this video we'll be talking about fertilization in sea urchin. So sea urchin is an aquatic animal found in mostly in sea and in uh, nearby region of the shore. So basically fertilization of the sea urchin is external fertilization. That means the fertilization is happening outside the body, not inside the body. Here is a male sea urchin which has released its sperm and here is a female sea urchin which has released it ovum into the environment. Now the sperm would eventually migrate toward the ovum and fertilize the ovum. That's it. It's quite simple, isn't it? But actually it's not that simple. Let me tell you why. Because at a given time point, one species of the sea urchin is not the only one in that particular habitat. There would be many more sea urchin species here represented in different colors. Now the point is how can sperm and egg meet in such a diluted concentration in a seawater? Second thing is like how does sperm of one sea urchin species is able to recognize the ovum of the same species? How does cross fertilization into two different species doesn't happen? How these events are actually taken care of? This now seems to be a problem. But in this video, we would try to understand that. So here, it's clear that the ovum of one particular species would kind of secrete some molecule to attract the sperm. And basically, these are chemoattractant molecule and the sperm would undergo a process called chemotaxis. That means kind of like its motility is influenced by a, a secreted molecule. So important points that we have to remember is the sea urchin ovum not only can control the type of sperm they attract but also it can regulate the time they want to attract the sperm. The best time to attract the sperm is when the ovum is mature. So these are the factors that are taken care of by the sea urchin ovum. Now here is the sea urchin ovum and let's talk about the mechanism of chemotaxis, how, how it differs in different species. So chemotactic molecules are different in different species. Even if the species are closely related, these molecules are quite different. So sperm motility is acquired only after the sperm is spawned into the aquatic environment. So initially in the gonad, the sperm is immotile because the pH is 7.2. Outside the gonad, pH has rise to 7.6, so the sperm become motile. So here in the sperm, the activation of dynein ATPase ensures that the flagella would now show wave-like movement and the sperm can sw start swimming vigorously. But the question is, how does the chemoattractant factor works? Because that's the prerequisite of fertilization to occur. And how does sperm get its directionality? So let's talk about the mechanism of sperm chemotaxis towards the ovum. So if we zoom into the membrane of the sperm, we would see there are specific receptor guanylyl cyclase, which kind of recept specific molecules from the egg, such as a resect molecule from the egg. And this triggers a signal which activates GTP and converts it into cyclic GMP. Cyclic GMP gated channels open in response and cyclic GMP gated channels are cation channels so calcium influx happen. This calcium triggers the motility and it's important to note that the molecule which triggers this entire calcium elevation response is highly species specific. An experiment has been done where acrosomal reaction or sperm motility is checked with different species which are closely related in terms of sea, in terms of uh, species distance they are close but each of these species has their unique uh, attractant factor that triggers the acrosomal reaction or the sperm motility so this tells us this kind of reaction is highly species specific now let's talk about basically the fertilization process we already understood the problem of navigation of the sperm towards the ovum. Now that is solved. Let's talk about the fertilization. It's also a challenging job because the egg has several layers. There is a jelly coat layer which has to be penetrated. There is an extracellular matrix layer called vitaline membrane or vitaline ECM. Then there is egg membrane that has to be penetrated. 
So here is the sperm. Here you can see the nucleus, acrosome, the actin filaments just behind the acrosomal pro acrosome and then there is centriole. So the sperm sort of contact the jelly-like layer and then acrosomal reaction happens. So the granules that are present in the acrosome are now released. It would help the sperm to penetrate this jelly-like layer. Eventually the jelly-like layer is getting digested and sperm is getting closer and closer to the nuclear envelope. Eventually the vitelline, so there are, there would be binding of the sperm to the vitelline envelope. Eventually, there would be receptor-based interaction that will trigger the membrane fusion of sperm and the ovum, which would lead to the nucleus to be getting inside of the ovum. And this is the overview of the fertilization process. And let's delve into details. So here we can see the head of the sperm. Here you can see the acrosomes. Now the question is, acrosome reaction is initiate, initiated by sulfate-containing polysaccharides present in the egg jelly. Again, this is highly species specific interaction. So here we can see there are specific uh, mo uh, molecules from the egg that triggers the cyclic GMP response and allows calcium to uh, get inside the cell and calcium level initiation activates the rho kinases. Rho kinase help in cytoskeletal rearrangement that creates the acrosomal process which is a thin filament of actin, uh, actin fibers. Now here we can see at the outside of these acrosomal process there is binding. Binding is some molecule that would eventually bind to the binding receptor on the other side uh, in the in the uh, binding uh, in the egg membrane. So this binding receptors and binding interaction is really important, and this interaction is also species specific. Now once the binding receptor is bound to the binding then the fusion would initiate fusion would be initiated now the cytoplasm of the sperm is continuum with the cytoplasm of the ovum right now this actin would create kind of like a narrow passageway through which the nucleus would eventually move towards the egg cytoplasm but just the moment when this fusion happens then there is a quick influx of sodium ion inside the cell that quickly creates the inside of the membrane highly positive. Generally resting membrane potential is minus 70 millivolt and due to sodium influx it quickly goes to zero that means it becomes more and more positive. When it is more and more positive it is making it hard for other sperms to enter the same ovum and this is happening almost instantly when first sperm make its way to the ovum and this is known as the first block of polyspermy this is why multiple sperm cannot fertilize one ovum this is why there is a one sperm one ovum fertilization rule now here you can see multiple sperm are trying to reach the ovum at almost at the simultaneous time but one has made it and injected its nucleus just after the first block, already the chances that other sperm would get in is almost reduced. But that was a transient change. Things has to be more sustained and more uh, permanent. And this change is triggered by a reaction known as cortical, cortical granular reaction. These are vesicles filled up with enzymes. These cortical granules are fused to the egg membrane in response to the sperm and uh, un in, in response to the union of sperm and the ovum. So here we zoom in and here we can see the binding basically has uh, interacted with the binding receptor that triggers tyrosine, tyrosine kinase. Tyrosine kinase activates phospholipase C which further activates cleaves PIF2 to IP3 and DAG. IP3 bind to the IP3 receptor on the endoplasmic reticulum of the egg and lead to calcium influx and elevation of the calcium in the cytosol. So elevation of the calcium in the cytosol triggers the cortical granule fusion. Also elevation of calcium lead to many metabolic changes. Once these granules are fused with the membrane, many changes happen. In the vitelline ECM, there are many fibrous protein. First of all, this attachment point of these fibrous protein with the egg membrane is now loosened up because many serine proteases are released in format of these cort uh, cortical granules. Second of all, these receptors that were essential for the sperm binding, these binding receptors are now resolved or destroyed using these serine proteases as well. 
so all these phenomena make sure that the second sperm cannot make its way in this is known as the cortical granule reaction and this is the sole uh, molecular event underlying the slow block question is what triggers this reaction the elevation of the cytosolic calcium one thing we have to remember that elevation of cytosolic calcium is a very important event in this process now let us try to understand the entire process of uh, fertilization with a flow chart here we have the first event sperm binding or fusion of the sperm membrane with the oocyte membrane that triggers many things first of all membrane potential would change and that would lead to a quick block of polyspermy known as fast block second the kinase would kinase activation would happen phospholipase c mediated generation of ip3 would lead to calcium elevation in the cytosol of the oocyte calcium would lead to cortical granule uh, fusion which would ultimately lead to a slow block and also it would lead to a hyaline layer formation it would make a impermeable layer and uh, almost making it impossible for a incoming second sperm to enter the ovum second nad kinase activation would happen that would resume the membrane biosynthesis now there would be degradation of the cyclin which would resume the cell cycle second there would be also dag production by the activity of uh, activity of the phospholipase c and then protein kinase c which is activated by dag would play important role it would change the intracellular ph and along with calcium elevation that can trigger many cellular event like dna synthesis protein synthesis cytoplasmic movement of the morphogenetic material that are already there all these event would ultimately make sure the second uh, the post fertilization events are triggered so i hope this video was good enough to explain all the events in sea urchin uh, fertilization process if you like this video give it a quick thumbs up but one thing i have to tell you that this events that we see in sea urchin are not exactly similar in mammal because the fertilization in mammal is basically intrinsic that means it is not a external fertilization it's an internal fertilization that is happening so there would be differences which we would appreciate in a different video so see you in the next video